it's an honour to have been invited to speak at this very prestigious occasion, celebrating the centenary of the East Lothian Antiquarian and Field Naturalist Society. They didn't go in for snappy kind of titles in those days. Now, as you can see from the title of my talk, I'll explore the history of East Lothian through the lens of language, as exemplified by place names. And these are by far our best tool for understanding the linguistic history of a place which in turn sheds important light on political, social, and settlement history. The subject area is vast, so in the time allotted, I'll be talking chiefly on names created before about 1200. Now, before I go any further, I'd like to pay tribute to Liz Curtis and Bill Patterson of the Scottish Place Name Society. I've benefited hugely from their work on and knowledge of East Lothian, its place names and their languages, as well as its landscape. Liz, also a member of the society, has in fact been working on a popular booklet on East Lothian place names for several years, and she assures me it's nearly finished. Now, the linguistic of the area we now call East Lothian is rich and complex. And the, there are five main languages which um, tell us, uh, which go, go to make up the, the, the namescape of East Lothian. I'll just read it very quick. I won't read all the names, but you've got Northern Britonic, or Britonic, names like Trenent, Traprain, Old English, uh, like Bolton and uh, Tinningham, uh, Norse, Humby, Pogby, Gaelic, Ballincreef, Balgone, uh, and Scots, Gladsmuir, uh, Gateside, etc. Now, the, these... Um, any historical overview of East Lothian must, of course, start with the, the Votadini, an elite population group or groups which controlled the area, which may or may not have included the Lothians, I say that for Fraser Hunter, um, the, um, during the, the Roman period. I, I know the actual extent, yeah, it's, um, it, it is a subject of debate, um, but what I want to do here is concentrate on the name Votadini, not, not the area, and to look at toponymic traces which situate their early medieval successors, at least, in Lothian. Now, it's generally accepted that the name Votadini is of Celtic origin, maybe containing a word meaning support, and also it's a, a personal name, so it might actually be an ancestral figure uh, of, of that people. Um, the, um, from the the, the Votadini, the next step in the development of the name is to Godothin, since early Celtic regularly, the Wa regularly went to Goa and then G in Northern Britonic, uh, and that was the language spoken in this area south of the Forth and, and closely related to modern Welsh. Now, the Godothin are a people covering what is very roughly southeast Scotland, best known from the old Welsh heroic poem of that name. But the name is also found, uh, Godothin, is also found in a 9th century text called the Historia of Ratonum. And it calls the region now covering Clackmannanshire and East Stirlingshire, Manau Godothin, best interpreted as the kingdom of Manau, beside or closely associated with the Godothin, to distinguish from the other Manau, which is the Isle of Man. Now, there is, or rather was, one East Lothian place name which commemorates the Godothin. It appears in its Gaelic form in the old Gaelic poem, Duan Alapanach. This is an 11th century poem of 37 verses enumerating the kings of Alba, or Scotland, north of the Forth, from the mythical beginnings up to Malcolm III. Uh, Malcolm Canmore died 1093. Um, the, in this poem, on the boundary of Alba, is a feature called Rin Fianach, Fodderine. You can see it, I've put up there, it's a little verse saying, Brutus took possession of noble Alba up to the far seen point of Fodderine. Now, um, I've already mentioned that the the word in, in early Celtic went to G in uh, Britonic. However, in Gallic, the other main branch of Celtic, in Gallic it went to a th for Freddy. So, Fodderin there is the exact linguistic equivalent of Godothin. Now, far the best candidate for this far seen point of Fodderin is North Berwick Law. And it, it's um, generally the, the consensus is, and it's amazing because scholars are always arguing about things, but this is one thing they don't argue about. They, they think that, that is the, um, the, the far seen point of So, you can see um, the name. Uh, 
up until the 12th century at least, um, remaining in, um, at least in, in Gaelic speakers from the north. Now, of course, the other, um, the other big name is Lothian itself. Um, you can see some early forms there. Our earliest goes back to about the, the, the 10th century. Um, and it derives from a place which in early Celtic would have been something like Lugodunon, the hill or fortress of Lug, one of the chief gods in the Celtic pantheon. Now, the eminent Celticist John Cook would see the underlying form of Lothian as, I've got it up here, um, Lugo, Lugoduniana, meaning the country of Lugodunon, maybe the country controlled by Lugodunon. Now, there are several places on the continent with this name, the best known being Lyon in, in France. We don't know where Lugodunon itself was, but it was presumably a high conspicuous feature, maybe Traprain Law or Edinburgh Castle Rock. And we can assume it was coined by non-Christians, given that it's got a Celtic pagan god in the name. Now, it's not clear why Lothian should have ousted the Godothan as the name for the whole territory. It's possibly because it was, it was the main power centre. The territory controlled by this place was then named after it. Um, but the, the Gallic poem that I, I quoted there, um, talking about the, the Rain Fodovan, 11th century, it does show that that name also existed side by side with Lothian, up, at least up until the, the 12th century. And now you can see from this slide, uh, yeah, the, the earliest ones go, go back to the 10th century, so there is definitely an overlap of usage between Godothian and Lothian. And of course, Lothian, I need to hardly tell you, means at this point all of southeast Scotland, right, right down to the Tweed. Now, from as early as about 600 AD, the Britonic speaking peoples of Lothian came under severe pressure from the expanding Old English speaking kingdom of Northumbria. Um, from a, the, probably the Northumbrians were established here by about 650, by about the middle of the 7th century. And from then onwards, the Firth of Forth formed the boundary between Northumbria on the south and Pictland on the north. Now, the end of Northumbrian political dominance in Lothian was complex and long drawn out, but it was probably finally, you know, finally over by the late, around about the millennium. And it was during this period of Northumbrian dominance that the Old English names in East Lothian were coined. But the Britonic language of the Godothan did not suddenly disappear when the Northumbrians took over. It continued to be spoken in East Lothian throughout the early Middle Ages, possibly in place, some places as late as the 11th century, alongside Old English. But during this period, its status would have gradually declined, meaning that it generated fewer and fewer names of important settlements and other features or that these names were lost. So I think we can assume that most of the Britonic names that have survived were well entrenched in the namescape by the time of the Northumbrian takeover in the 7th century. Indeed, some of those which can be recognized as such are of key fortifications, names which the Northumbrian would have been especially familiar with before during the conquest and were therefore more likely to, um, to adopt. Um, the, um, a good example of key fortified places which have retained their Britonic names are those with the element Dun. This is a Celtic word, meaning just that, a fortified place, especially a fortified hill or height. Now, where the original form of the word was practically identical in Gallic and Britonic, it did develop into Dean in Britonic, but um, it has, in the... East Lothian place named it has remained Dun, probably through later Gallic influence. Um, the, um, there are four main Dun names in um, major fortification Dun names in East Lothian Dunbar, Dumpelder, now Traprain Law, Dunglass, and probably Tantalan, probably also a Dune name. And I just want to look at two of these in, in a bit of detail. The first one you can see here is um, the Wheel Kent Dunbar. Um, yes, it is. Um, the, um, the, the best way of, of interpreting that name is, is a, a fortress on a summit. And here the, the Bar summit. Um, hill crest, very common in places, Bar Heed, etc. Um, the um, probably the the promontory rather than a head. So it's a it's a fort and a, pro a promontory fort. Basically, is what it means, and that's what it was as well, uh, where the 
the swimming pool now is, and um, the where the excavations were done and um, before before it was built. Um, the another very important dune name is Dumpelder, which has not survived, but it is the older name for Treprain Law. Now um, it's not. Well, first of all, um, to say a bit about the name itself, you can see there it contains a Britonic word, pallidur, uh, pallidur, meaning it means a shaft or, or, a, or a spear shaft. And uh, Alan James, a uh, very prominent Celticist and place name scholar, thinks that it could be referred to as spikes, spike stakes along the, along the ramparts uh, to impede uh, impede attackers. So, um, so you've got the, the fortress of the, or, or, of the, of the, the spear shaft, as it were. Um, now, it's not clear why the older name ousted, uh, was ousted by Treprain Law, because Treprain is a farm a short distance to the the east. Um, the you, you can see there the, um, uh, the the sort of the geography of the the area. Um, the hill probably served the farm as its area of rough grazing, and hills are very often um, referred to after the farm, where the farm will, will graze it, its cattle and sheep. And um, it's probably that that is how the name Treprain took over the name of the of Dumpelder and, and ousted it. Um, of course, Treprain itself is a Britonic name containing the Britonic word Trev. Uh, which is just means a farm, a settlement, and the second second element probably pren, meaning a tree, possibly a, a large, very special tree. The trees were often used earlier as meeting places, gathering places. And it's possibly that that is the the significance of the pren and to pren. Um, and I've just uh, put a square in card Dinis, Cairn Dinis there as well on the left. Uh, Dinis is also a, a, a well, a Britonic word meaning a fortification related to the word Dune, so probably also referring to, to Prain Law. Now, besides these fortification names, it's remarkable how many other names have survived from the Britonic speaking period in East Lothian. I'm not going to go through them all. There's a, a list of some of the main ones. Uh, just read out very quickly um, for the people at the back. Aberlady, Carfrey, Garwold, Gullen, Tribrune and Trenent, Keith, Pencaitlin, Prismenon. Now, Keith and Pencaitlin are interesting. They both come from a Celtic word meaning a wood, a woodland. And Pencaitlin, uh, area at the head of a wood, the end of a wood. And the wood in Pencaitlin is probably the wood that is um, referred to in the word Keith. There must be a very important large wood there, giving rise to these two uh, important names. Uh, now, before I move on to the Northumbrian period and their names, there's one important point uh, to make about our Britonic names. This is that we're not dealing with a simple stratification of Britonic then overlaid by Old English. Um, Alan James, who I've already mentioned, he argued that Britonic, or as he called it, Cumbric, which he calls the later stage of Britonic, that this term he uses, um, and it lingers, Britonic or Cumbric lingers, especially in more upland areas, well into the Northumbrian period. I think I've alluded to that already. Uh, and it seems that as Northumbrian power waned, Britonic made a bit of a comeback. Now, the names um, formed with the Britonic element, Trev, as I say, a farm or farming settlement, are particularly relevant in this context. Now, both Trenent and Treprain lie on relatively good land. Trenent especially lies very favourably. And, but, uh, uh, sorry, this is going to get a wee bit technical. I'll, I'll, I'll get through it as you know, painlessly as possible. Um, one of the, the, um, the reasons why we're almost certain that Trenent is such an, a, a relatively recent name is uh, because it, in the middle, it's Trevernant are the early forms, the settlement or farm of the valley or the, 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 the den. And um, this of the, the the in the middle is a sign that the name is relatively late. They do, the name formation doesn't use the the of the valley, etc., until in, in uh, certainly in Celtic languages, until about the, the 11th century. So this is why we're pretty sure um, that this name is much later than the period when, uh, you know, Britonic was spoken as the main language and um, names like Dunbar were, were created. The, just to say the Nant there um, is, uh, that, that is the Nant of Trenent, the, 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 the 
the little valley there, and you're looking down into it. And of course, the, the hoof, um, which is a Scots word for a steep wooded side, refers to sort of one half of that uh, that nant. Now, um, I'll I'll move on, or in some cases, back to the Northumbrian period, when the bulk of the more important settlement names in East Lothian were coined. Now, we should always bear in mind that most, if not all, of these settlements displaced pre-existing Britonic names. Very few of them should be seen as kind of pioneer settlements or, or breaking out new land. Now, any discussion of Old English names must confront the tricky problem of distinguishing them from later Scots names, given that Scots evolved seamlessly out of Northern Old English. Scots, more specifically older Scots, applied to the language of Southern Scotland from about 1100, but it was more a political label than a linguistic one. People didn't wake up one morning and start speaking Scots when the day before they'd been speaking Old English, but they may have woken up to find they have new political masters. Now, there are several ways in which we can assign a name to Old English, that is to the period between about 600 and 1,000. Uh, the, there are certain, um, certain elements which were used to form places by Old English speakers which do not survive into uh, the Scots-speaking period. Ham, literally home, being a very important one, as in um, the um, or Old Ham or, or, or Moran. Uh, I've, li I've listed there on, on, the, um, on the, the slide there uh, some names which we know are Old English. Barra, coming word for, for Old English word for Grove, Inner Wick, Berwick, Hammer, now Whitekirk, meaning a cliff, Tinningham, and, and Broxmouth. Uh, um, the, um, the, the element there, weak, you see in Innerwick and, and Berwick, also means a settlement, but more of a dependent farm, of a, of a, a big, um, of, a, of a bigger farm, and very often specialising in particular products or a particular resource. Um, for example, uh, Berwick being barley or beer, and uh, Heatherwick clearly specialising in heather, which was actually an important resource in those days. One problematic element in all this is the element toon, which of course, again, farm name. And it, but of course, Scots toon, T-O-U-N, is a very common element as well, productive in both periods. And um, it, it's often combined with a personal name. Uh, and these can provide a vital clue as to the date of coining. Um, for example, Penston by Trenent, although it's first recorded in 1380, it contains the Anglo-Norman personal name Payne or Paganus. And we know who that Paganus was. He was Payne of Headley in Northumbria, and he was granted this land in Trenent in about 1170 by Robert Quincy. Now, we cannot say exactly when the name solidified into Payne's tune, but we can say absolutely certainly it was coined sometime after 1170 when Payne got the land. So we can conf confidently uh, ascribe that name to the Scots period. But when we come to um, Bof Bolton, um, there could be no doubt that uh, it was coined in Old English, as it contains a typically Old English element, Bothel, meaning a dwelling house, high status dwelling house usually. Uh, and the evidence in place names certainly points towards high status rank for Bothel. Bolton being, as I say, Bothel Toon, the, the, the farm of the, of the high status residence. Um, and of course, it is a common um, compound Bothel Toon. Think of all the Boltons in Northern England. Uh, but it's, um, but, and we've got a lovely, we've got Bolton, of course, in East Lothian. We've also got the eel bottle, which is another lovely example of this uh, bottle element. And this is of the highest status, eel bottle. We know it was a royal palace. Um, David I issued two charters there. In about, uh, and also later, in about 1220, it's described in this Latin charter as a vetus castellum, an old castle cum fosses with ditches. So that shows you just what an important place the Bothel was. So we can, um, we can assign, assigning various, um, using various criteria, we can assign about uh, 25 names uh, confidently to the period when East Lothian was part of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria. And there's 
actually not much more. Uh, it's not much more than the Britonic name stock. And, um, and I think this does tell us one thing, that the imposition of overlordship of Northumbria over the Godolphin was gradually, gradual and relatively peaceful. Uh, otherwise, there would not have been such a strong survival of Britonic names and the survival of the Britonic language, which we're seeing coming through. Uh, there's another language I want to throw into the mix of medieval East Lothian, and that's Gaelic, the other branch of the Celtic language group um, from uh, Britonic and Gaelic. This is the other one. And it was coming down from the north. It was absorbed into the... Uh, when East Lothian was absorbed into the Gaelic-speaking kingdom of, of Alba, of Scotland, north of the 4th in the late 10th to 11th century, um, really only the area around North Berwick has any significant Gaelic place nomenclature. Um, the, this is... Um, a wee map showing, this is from Pete Yeoman's pilgrimage book, uh, and you can see how how convenient that crossing North Berwick Ellsbury was, and how um, what a, as an easy place of transfer it would be from uh, from Fife for, for pilgrims as well, settlers as well as pilgrims. Now the Earls of Fife held land here and created the political milieu for settlement by Gaelic-speaking Fifers. And we don't know exactly when this process began, but it seems to be at its height in the 12th century, when um, Earl Duncan of Fife he died in 1154, he founded the North Berwick Nunnery. And one of the main roles of the nuns was to tend to the needs of the pilgrims going to and from St Andrews, which was becoming a major centre of pilgrimage around this time. Um, so, and you can see here the, um, the, the Earl, uh, he gave the, the nuns two, two hospices, one on either side of the crossing, and because the northern one still carries his name, Earl's Ferry by Ely. And I say this was really heavily used by pilgrims coming from the southeast because it saved this huge detour round, round by Queen's Ferry. Now, the Gallic names that seem to have been brought over from Fife, you had this invasion of Fifers, um, you can, there are, are two of them have this Bala name. Now, we've talked about this basic farm name. We've had the Trev in Britonic, we've had the Toon in Old English, the Toon in Scots, and now we have the Bala in Gaelic, all really equivalent to the, for all these units. And we have um, Balgone and Balancreef. And um, so there are a remarkable number of Gaelic-derived names in the air. Balancreef, Balgone, Luchy, we're pretty sure is a, a, a Gaelic uh, name, Kilmurdy, um, which is actually Ker um, Murdy, the quarter uh, of a man called Murdo. Side Surf, uh, a, a, a name alluding to the, the West Fife Saint Surf, who was really big over there. And um, he was also exported by the looks of it. Um, the, um, where are we? Yes. Now, the, another way that the, the Gales put their stamp on the place names of East Lothian is through their personal names, but combined with the Scots tune. We've got Congleton, Concogel, the Congle, the, the Gallic name, Ewingston from Yawin or Ewan, Gilchriston, Gilichrist, um, Gilmerton, Gilamora, and Gilica, you notice the Gila name, Gila word means servant of, so it's very a saint as a second name, and Gillicumston, which only appears once, but it's the site of the North Berwick nunnery. So it's a tune belonging to a man called Gillicum. And these Gila names uh, were all probably Gallic speakers, are just moving in, just but moving into the Scots speaking period. So another way in which Gallic has imprinted itself. Uh, how am I doing for time? Yes, look at my, yeah. Good. Oh, that's fine. Um, <laughs> now, I can't um, finish without mentioning the the, the fifth name, uh, fifth language. I did promise you five. Um, and that is uh, in East Lothian, that's Norse. Old Norse is Old Scandinavian. Now, we know that it was widely spoken throughout Britain from around 800 and has given rise to thousands of place names, for example, in the northern and western isles of Scotland, but also in, in the Midlands and north of England. But in eastern Scotland, Norse names are relatively rare. 
We have only five in East Lothian. Now, four of these contain the Norse element bu, yet another farm word. Um, they, and so we've got Humby, Blegby, Pogby, and Begby. And also we have another one, which is now Leaston. But you can see from the early forms, it was Lazen B. So it, it was, they've actually um, translated that final B into the Scots tun. And then Fidra is the containing the, the Old Norse word A, meaning an island. Now, the social and political context for these names is much debated. They could have been coined any time, really, between the 10th and the 12th century. And you'll be glad to know there's really no time to go into that now. Um, now, as I said at the outset, this talk is focused on East Lothian before about 1200, but place names don't stop telling their story after that date. Over the next 800 years, speakers of Scots, and latterly of Scottish Standard English, continued to create a rich and varied namescape. This ranges from the agricultural, such as Sheeling Hill and Buchnow, to the, the grimly judicial, such as Gallows Now, or the grimly superstitious, such as Witch's Psyche. And there's many referring to industries, like Press and Pans, and um, also to saints, like Mungo's Well. There are also the self-deprecating humorous names, which we find throughout the lowlands of Scotland, often apply to small, later settlements, such as Hungry Hill by Aberlady, or Bare Bones, or you get the more upbeat humour of Liberty Hall, Canty Hall, or Pish Wanton, one of my favourite, and not forgetting the charming Blink Bonnie, which Ruth Curtis has written about. Unless we think of place names as telling us only about the past, we've only to think of the stushy surrounding the naming of the new town of Blindwells to realise that they can also tell us about the present. Thank you.